Okay. So maybe I will start. So we were talking last time about the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. I will uh, restate it. So the statement is a uh, so the is a bijection. Uh, so if uh, so if let uh, L over K be a Galois extension, then we have uh, bijections. Uh, between uh, so the, the Galois extension, say, with Galois group G. Well, maybe you can just write like that. So we have bijections between the subgroups of the Galois group. And uh, the intermediate fields. And the, so we have these bijections which are inverse to each other. To a subgroup, we associate the fixed field. So these are all elements in uh, L which are fixed by, so sent to themselves by uh, all elements in H. And to an intermediate field, we uh, associate the subgroup of the Galois group, which is the Galois group of L over the, this intermediate field. So these are mutually inverse bijections. So if we start with any subgroup of the Galois group, take the fixed field, and then the Galois group of L over the fixed field, this is just H. And if you do it the other round, if you start with the field, take the Galois group of L over the field, and then the fixed field of that, this will be the original field, F. OK. So now, uh, in some sense, the next thing is still, in a suitable sense, part of the principle or the main the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Namely, one can ask ourselves, how can we, what is, um, uh, so when, what is the condition on the subgroup so that this intermediate field F is also Galois over K? Or one could also ask, uh, so which means what is the condition for F over K to be a normal extension? In the same way, you can ask yourself, you know, special subgroups that you can have are normal subgroups. You can ask yourself what kind of... Uh, uh, field, you know, intermediate fields correspond to normal subgroups. The point is that the, <coughs> and the result is that these two notions of normal are the same, which is not a coincidence because they actually, I think normal subgroups are called normal subgroups because they were, you know, group theory essentially is, was born out of Galois theory and uh, so normal subgroups are subgroups for which uh, the group for which the intermediate field is normal. So let me state that so we want to show we are again in the situation that L over K is a Galois extension. And um, so at F, say it an intermediate field. Um, then uh, we want to show that uh, f over k is a normal extension if and only if the Galois group of L over f 
is a normal subgroup. Okay. So let's start doing this. Um, so first we uh, introduce a notation. So, <coughs> so if we have our intermediate field, so let F be an intermediate field of our uh, error extension L over F, L over K, um, and let uh, alpha be an element in the Galois group, then we call alpha of F, well, it's just alpha of F. I mean, alpha by itself is an automorphism of L to itself. So alpha of f is the image of this automorphism. So this is just a set of all alpha of a with uh, a in f. And you can check immediately that alpha of f is an intermediate field. So, you know, we just have to see that it's a field, so it's kind of clear this alpha will send 1 to 1 and 0 to 0 because it's a field homomorphism. It sends the sum to the sum and the product to the product. So, therefore, it follows, and the quotient to the quotient, so therefore it follows that, uh, you know, alpha of f is a field, you know, just because alpha is a, a group homomorphism, a, a ring homomorphism. Oh. Okay. And so we have the following statement, lemma. So first we have a simple statement which we use in order to prove this. So we take again F as such an intermediate field. Of a Galois extension, do we need that? Yeah. L over K, and we take some element in uh, the Galois group. Then we want to say what is uh, the Galois group of uh, alpha of F, uh, of L over alpha of F. So the claim is then the Galois group L over alpha of F is equal to, we take the Galois group of L over F and we basically conjugate it with alpha. So we take alpha to the minus one, the Galois group alpha. As we see, that's almost direct from the definition. Well, I mean, it is directly from the definition. We just check what it means. So, so we take an element in the Galois group, say of uh, of this. Um, so we take an element in the Galois group of L over K. We have to ask ourselves what is the condition on it so that it's an element here. So then phi is an element in the Galois group of L over alpha of f, if and only if it sends every element of alpha of f to itself. So, or I could say it equivalently, this is if and only if, if I take phi of alpha of a is equal to alpha of a for all a in f. Now, this is the same as saying that it sends any, any, every element in alpha of f to itself. Mm -hmm. 
Well, obviously, now <coughs> this just means you can you multiply here by you know, alpha is an automorphism. You can compose with the inverse of it. So this is equivalent to saying that alpha alpha to the minus one phi alpha. Uh, if I applied, you know, this is of A is equal to A for all A in F. So this means that alpha to the minus one phi alpha is in the Galois group of um, L over F. No, that's what it means. And uh, <coughs> so conversely, this means if now we, you know, conjugate, we multiply with uh, alpha on this side, with alpha to the minus one on the other side, uh, we find that phi is in, so this is equivalent to saying that phi is an element in alpha to the alpha Galois of L over F, alpha to the minus one. Okay, so that's very simple. It's just the definition. Now we want to actually use this to prove uh, this statement. So theorem. So we have again the same situation. So L over F over K Galois extension. F an intermediate field. So then the following are equivalent. So first, that uh, F over K is normal. The second is that, uh, uh, so if I take, if I apply alpha to F, this is equal to F for all alpha in the Galois group of L over K. So I'm not saying that every element of F is mapped to itself. It just means that every element of F is mapped to an element of F. No? Because otherwise, if uh, this would be uh, the Galois group of L over F, but this is not what I'm saying. And the third one is that uh, the Galois group of L over F is a normal subgroup. of the big Galois group. Okay, so we want to see this. <coughs> so this is also useful uh, remark that this is equivalent to f over k being normal. So, so we have to prove all these uh, implications, so from one to two. So we assume that f over k is normal. And let uh, we take an element a in f. And uh, we have to show, I mean, just to remember, but we have to show, and we, uh, what is it? We have to show, and see, maybe we also uh, let uh, alpha be an element in the Galois group of um, L over K. And then we have to show that alpha of A is also an element of F. No, then we have proven two. 
for every element A and F and every element in the Galois group of L over K alpha of A is in F. Okay. So let's see. So we take um, F be the minimal polynomial of A over K. As F is normal over K, and this small f is a polynomial, an irreducible polynomial, in Kx with a 0 over f, it follows that f splits over the field f. So I could also say this all roots of, uh, uh, say, f in L lie already in F. So we have now, if we take our element alpha in the Galois group of L over K, then as usual, we have that if we take um, F of alpha of A, is equal to alpha of f of a is equal to 0. We have used this many times. So alpha of a is also alpha of a is a 0 is a root of f. And so we know that all roots uh, of f and l lie in the field F, so it follows that alpha of A is an element in F, and that was all. But we used the, the fact that we have a normal extension. Um, well, actually, we have to show a little bit more. We wanted to show that these two are equal. Now, we have shown only that alpha of F is contained in F. No? So what I have said, read here, wrote here is not completely correct. So we have to show this, but we have also shown the other. So thus, we have that alpha of f is contained in f. Now, <clears throat> we can apply the same argument for the automorphism alpha to the minus 1. So, you know, doing the same with uh, alpha replaced by alpha to the minus 1, we get alpha to the minus 1 of f is contained in f, which is equivalent, so particular implies that f is contained in alpha f. So f is equal to alpha f. So this shows 2. Now we want to go from 2 to 3. So we have this identity, which we're going to use in a moment. But well, whatever, maybe I'll leave it for one second. So 2 to 3. We want to show that the Galois group of L over F is a normal subgroup of this. So we take uh, alpha, an element in the Galois group of L over K. Then uh, we know that if we take alpha, the Galois group of L over F, 
alpha to the minus 1 by what is written here, this is equal to uh, the Galois group of L over alpha of F. So if we, by assumption, you know, we assume that uh, here 2 is true, so that alpha F is equal to F. So, so by assumption, this is equal to the Galois group of L over F by assumption because uh, alpha F is equal to F. So the Galois group of L over alpha F is equal to the Galois group of L over F. So by assumption. So this says we have this subgroup such that for every element in the big Galois group, if I conjugate by it, I get uh, uh, back the same subgroup. So this means precisely this is a normal subgroup. So now, <clears throat> what? now we come to the last bit. So we want to go from 3 to 1. So we assume that the Galois group of L over F is a normal subgroup. And we have to show that uh, the extension is normal. So. 3 to 1. So assume the Galois group of L over F is a normal subgroup. Of the Galois group of L over K. So we know, therefore, if we use again this lemma, that if we take the Galois group of L over K over F, this is, a, you know, we basically just reverse this. This is uh, so for all alpha an element in the Galois group of L over K. We have that if we, the Galois group of L over F is the same as if we conjugate by this uh, element. And uh, we had seen that, you know, always this is equal to Galois group of L over alpha of F. Now, I haven't stressed it before, but if you remember, the fundamental theorem of Galois theory says that you know you have this bijection, so the map which is which associates to an intermediate field, the Galois group of L over the intermediate field is a bijection. So that means if these two Galois groups are equal for F and for alpha F, it means that F is equal to alpha F. No? The map which sends an in intermediate field to the Galois group of L over the intermediate field is a bijection to the subgroups. So, so by the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, it follows that F is equal to alpha of f. So, <clears throat> so in some sense, we actually have just reversed this step. No? But now we, you know, we have to reserve, reverse the other step. So now we take again. So now let's take let uh, a be an element 
in F. And we take, um, say, F, uh, the, uh, say, the minimal polynomial of this thing. So let's see. So what do we want to show? No. And let F be an, an irreducible polynomial. F in Kx be irreducible. Um, with uh, a with f of a is equal to zero. So we take an irreducible polynomial with a zero. So I actually I don't have to do it like that. So let f be an irreducible polynomial in Kx with is with a zero uh, a in F. Then the f that the field extension F over K is normal means that F already splits over the field large F into linear factors. Uh, all roots of B. lie in F. So we know that, you know, as, um, so as L over K is a, a normal extension, we know that uh, this polynomial F splits over L into linear factors. So we have to show that for any element B in L, for any zero, for any root B of this polynomial in L, that it lies already in F. Let's um, roots B of F in L lie in F. So, as I said, uh, so as so I repeat what I just said, as L over K is a Galois extension is a, uh, in particular normal, uh, we know that under this assumption, in this case, we know that F splits over L into linear factors. And thus, if we have this, it also splits over F. And thus, if uh, its roots in L lie in F, it also splits over F. Okay. So, <clears throat> so we have to show that this. So we take a root. So let B in L be another root. So <clears throat> F is an irreducible polynomial in Kx. So up to multiplying by a constant, it is the minimal polynomial of A, uh, and therefore also the minimal polynomial of B. No? So A, so <clears throat> If I have a monic irreducible polynomial which has a zero, it's the minimal polynomial of that, but I always can divide by the leading term. So thus F is the minimal polynomial of A and of B over K. But then <clears throat> we have this statement about uh, um, you know, if we have a Galois extension and we have two polynomials 
uh, two elements in the bigger field which have the same uh, minimal polynomial, there is a, an element in the Galois group which sends one to the other. So thus there exists an element uh, say phi in the Galois group of L over K with phi of A is equal to B. Um, <coughs> but um, we have that uh, for every element in the Galois group, F is equal to alpha of F, or in this case, F is equal to phi of F. So thus, our element B is an, is an element in phi of F, which is equal to F. And so we have found that uh, uh, this root already lies in F, which means that it is that we do have a normal extension. So thus F is normal. Over K. Okay, so we see uh, that uh, the intermediate fields for which we have a normal extension correspond precisely to the normal subgroups. In this case, <coughs> we can also easily compute the Galois group of F over K. It's just the, the quotient of the Galois group of L over K by the Galois group of L over F. I mean, we can form the quotient because this now is a normal subgroup. So we have a quotient group, and the quotient will be the Galois group of uh, the intermediate field over K. So corollary. So again, let L over K be a Galois extension. And um, F an intermediate field. OK, intermediate field. Intermediate field such that field such that uh, if I take f over k, this is normal. This is a normal field extension. Then, not very surprisingly, we have that uh, the Galois group of f over k is equal to the quotient of the, or if you want isomorphic, to, to the uh, quotient of the Galois group of l over k by the Galois group of L over F. So, <clears throat> so we can only write down this quotient because uh, F over K is normal because this uh, ensures that this would be normal subgroup. So we have a quotient group. And uh, OK. So that's, uh, I mean, can, this is quite simple. We just have to remember more or less the definitions. So if we have an element alpha in the Galois group of L over K, then we know that if we restrict that it sends F to itself, no? then alpha of F is equal to f, as we had seen. So therefore, if we restrict alpha to f, it becomes an automorphism of f. So thus, if I take alpha restricted to f, this is a field automorphism from f to f. And it will be an element in the Galois group of f over k. 
No, it's a map, it's a field isomorphism from F to F, because obviously it's inverse is alpha to the minus, is the restriction of alpha to the minus one. And um, it's the identity on K because uh, the original alpha was. So we have a, thus we can take any element in the Galois group of L over K and restrict it to F. This obviously is a group homomorphism. So, so the restriction map So from so maybe R from the Galois group of L over K to the Galois group of F over K, which sends alpha to alpha restricted to F, is obviously a group homomorphism. After all, the uh, group structure is by composition. And what is the kernel? So an element alpha lies in the kernel if alpha restricted to f is the identity. So if it sends every element of f to itself. But this is precisely the definition of you know, the alphas, which are the identity on f, is precisely the Galois group of L over f. So with kernel. Uh, Galois group of L over F. So, <coughs> so we have a group homomorphism whose kernel is this. So then we know that the image of this group homomorphism is isomorphic to the source divided by the kernel. So thus, so the image of R, which is a subgroup of the Galois group of f over k is isomorphic to the Galois group of L over k divided by the Galois group of L of uh, uh, L over f. So then, to show our uh, uh, our claim, we have to show that R is surjective. So that's to see. So why would it be subjective? Well, you know, we, we don't really have to care. We know um, in order to see it's subjective, it is, you know, we know this is isomorphic to the image. It's maybe enough to say that this has as many elements as this. So you want to see, uh, I mean, or that, that this one uh, that uh, the Galois group of F okay so so but um, uh, if we take this quotient the Galois group of uh, L over K divided by the Galois group of L over F so these are both Galois extensions so for Galois extension, we know that the degree of the field extension is equal to the number of elements in the Galois group. So I divide the number of elements, okay? Or I could say, if I take the number of elements in this quotient, this is the quotient of the number of elements, and this is equal to uh, L over K divided by L over F. But now by the... Um, what was it, the degree theorem, we have that L over K is L over F times F over K. So it follows that this is equal to F over K by the degree theorem. And um, as um, uh, F over K is a Galois extension, it follows that this is equal to the number of elements in the Galois group of F over K. And so we have a, you know, an injective, injective map from this quotient to, uh, to the Galois group of uh, 
f over k. And this quotient has as, any as many elements of this, so it's a bijection. Thus, they are isomorphic. So, Galois group of L over K divided by the Galois group of L over F. So you see, it's. Uh, so these are all rather simple consequences of this principle theorem. So let me study one. So I hope it's kind of clear. Anyway, we have seen. So this anyway is a simple corollary, but uh, we can, in the simple way, describe the Galois group of uh, such an intermediate field if it's normal. So let me look at one example, which we had before. I mean, to show in a simple case how one can analyze uh, these field extensions. So we had this particularly simple example of a polynomial f equal to x to the 4 plus 1, which is a you know, polynomial with coefficients in q. And we had seen that if alpha is root, uh, of this, then it splits into linear factors. So if uh, alpha is a root of f, then uh, over q alpha, we have, as you have seen a few times, that f can be written as x minus alpha times x plus alpha times x minus 1 over alpha times x plus 1 over alpha. And we had also seen that the Galois group is isomorphic to Z times Z2 times Z2. So the Galois group of, um, of F, I could say, so the Galois group of Q alpha over Q, we had seen was isomorphic uh, to Z2 times Z2. And uh, the elements could be described as, uh, so obviously you have the identity. So maybe I call this the identity of, um, so the identity. Then we have the map that sends alpha to minus alpha. So the elements are, um, so the map alpha is sent to minus alpha, which I call how do I call it? Mu. I mean, you can see if you send alpha to minus alpha, there's a unique way how this becomes an, a, K, a Q automorphism of this field. No, you know precisely where to send the other roots. And then, uh, and um, you can have, say, delta, which sends alpha to 1 over alpha. And then you can take, say, the composition of these two, which sends, so this would be mu delta, which sends uh, alpha to uh, minus 1 over alpha. OK, so we have, um, so in particular, this thing, this Z2 times Z2, we can see what its subgroups are. And then we want to see what the inter corresponding intermediate fields are. And now I have a little bit, little room. So we have, if we take here, if I can see it. We have here the, the diagram of subgroups. So we have, say, one, so the neutral element, which uh, you know this always means it's contained. So this is contained in subgroup generated by mu, in the subgroup generated by delta, and in the subgroup generated by mu delta. And they are all just have the element one in common. And uh, then we have the whole group, which I maybe call right, so the color group of F. So you have this diagram of fields. And we know there's a bijection of this with um, the corresponding uh, fixed fields. 
So the fixed field of the whole Galois group is obviously just Q I mean, by the principal theorem of Galois theory. So <coughs> if you send, you know, you have to think a little bit, but uh, if you send alpha to minus alpha, uh, you can certainly see that alpha squared will be invariant under this action. And uh, it's easy to see, you know, that alpha squared, is, so in this case, you know, the <coughs> alpha to the squared will be uh, minus one, so it would be some, uh, so it's not an element. So al alpha, alpha to the four would be minus one. So alpha squared is not an element of Q. So you do have an extension of at least de of degree two. So <coughs> we find, we can look here to this. So we find that the fixed field of this mu certainly contains this. On the other hand, we see that this field is not equal to, so we had Q was the fixed field of the whole thing. So the, the fixed field of this con certainly contains Q alpha squared because uh, we have just seen that alpha squared is invariant and it's easy to see that the degree of this Q alpha squared over Q is indeed two. I mean, you can certainly see that Q alpha squared is not equal to Q. And then the degree must be two because <coughs> uh, there's no more room. Obviously the one you have Q alpha, and then here, if you take the delta, you send alpha to one over alpha. So something which certainly will be invariant under this is Q of alpha plus one over alpha. And again, you can see, you can uh, check that this will not be an element of Q. So therefore, this uh, will indeed be the fixed field. And in the same way, for the other one. So anyway, I, haven't, I do not do the details, but this would be the corresponding diagram of fields. Uh, maybe one should uh, look at more interesting, what's the question? Ah, uh, not. Yes. Yeah. So this is, I mean, it's the same, it's supposed to correspond to in the same order, yeah. Okay, so maybe for the moment, what time is it? Uh -huh. Yeah, so <clears throat> I now want to kind of <clears throat> go a little bit back to the, uh, kind of classical problems that uh, uh, people were looking at, which had motivated looking at this stuff. So this uh, is about uh, uh, solutions of polynomials, polynomial equations by radicals. So you want, you have a, a polynomial in Qx with coefficients in Q, and you want to find the formula for a zero of that polynomial, just in terms of, you know, writing a formula with uh, somehow in terms of the coefficient of the polynomial and then plus, minus, uh, and taking some roots. No? Um, and in the, so <clears throat> in the 17th, 18th, and to some extent 19th century, this was studied quite a lot. So in particular, um, the first instance of this are the cubic polynomials, so I want to briefly uh, review uh, what happens there. So let me just write it down. So, so a big classical problem <coughs> was uh, 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 the solution or was the uh, solution of polynomial equations, um, equations by radicals. So you want to find a zero for a polynomial in, so find a zero for 
the polynomial in Kx. So in, say, Qx normally. Um, in terms of, you know, where you just do the normal operations uh, using uh, uh, only, you can say, plus, minus, and somehow the nth root. Um, <clears throat> and this was first, so I expect, uh, so in school, you have studied the case of polynomials of degree two. Okay, and I can briefly do this. So from school, you know, So if you have a polynomial, so the, the formula for a quadratic pol polynomial, so this is, uh, so we have uh, f is equal to x squared plus px plus q. Obviously, we can normalize it to be uh, uh, monic by dividing by the leading coefficient. And then the formula is the usual one. <laughs> so we have, uh, so we have the, the solutions are, so what is it? Minus p halves plus or minus uh, square root of p divided by two squared minus q. Okay. So this everybody uh, knows. So in, yeah, incidentally, I was told that uh, so in, in in Germany, when you become want to become professor, you have to give a talk on some advanced topic, and uh, then afterwards people will decide on you know how good the lecture was, and so somebody apparently gave some very difficult lecture, and uh, so after the lecture, there's people are supposed to ask questions. And so no, nobody could ask a reasonable question because they hadn't understood the lecture. And so they asked him, ah, can you tell us something about the solution of quadratic polynomials? And uh, he couldn't remember the formula, and so he didn't become <laughs> professor. So it's important to, uh, to know this formula. Um, <clears throat> OK, so now let's look at the case of the, <coughs> uh, so in the 17th centuries, or maybe even the 16th, a formula was, was found for cubic poly polynomials. So we have the formula of Cardano and uh, Tartaglia, I think, um, found a formula for cubic polynomials. Also, that is quite funny. So in those days, uh, mathematics was some kind of spectator sports. So you would have, um, you know, for instance, these two people who would uh, kind of, kind of challenge each other. There would be some public thing, and everybody would give to some the other one a cubic equation to solve, and then they would kind of like uh, make a duel. So if somebody did something that the other one couldn't solve, then, and so they, so and they would uh, kind of earn their money with these duels. So it's kind of, and so they had kind of, they found this formula, but they kept it secret uh, so that they could win duels with it. And I think Cardano published it, which uh, Tataria was very angry about. Anyway, but now let's look at it. So we will just rederive this formula. It's quite simple. So we look at the cubic polynomial at f. So say like this. Maybe I call it a to x plus a1 x plus a0 be a cubic polynomial. So, so anyway, we can just, uh, so we have this cubic polynomial <clears throat> and we want to find a solution. So first one makes a variable transformation, which in some sense is the basis of the solution also for the quadratic one. We can, we want to get rid of this coefficient. That's very easy. So we make the variable change x, we replace by x minus a2 divided by 3. 
So if you, so we, we, we compute f of, of, uh, of x minus a2 divided by 3. If you do this, we see that this, co this coefficient vanishes. And obviously, if you find the zero of the polynomial, so for, so if, say, alpha is a zero of uh, f of x minus a2 divided by 3, then not very surprisingly, uh, alpha plus a2 divided by 3 is a zero of f. So we can certainly make this transformation and get rid of the quadratic term. So with this, can assume that uh, f is of the form x to the 3 uh, plus what which we around we wanted it, px plus q. So we get rid of the quadratic term. So now we want to find a solution. Um, and now comes the trick, which is very strange indeed. I don't know why. So, I mean, this is not really Galois theory. I just review uh, the, this result. Come the trick, we put x to u minus v. So we write this polynomial now as if, you know, we put u minus v instead of x. I mean, nobody can hinder us from doing that, but why this should help is completely unclear. But let's just do it. So if you make f of u minus v, well, you can compute it. Maybe don't for detail. Um, so I, you will get this. I think you will be able to verify this, <coughs> unless obviously one has to be able to distinguish the u from the v here. Otherwise, it's difficult. OK. So we have this equation. And now, so now comes uh, somehow a miracle. So now there comes some kind of, uh, we go on with the trick. So in, we want to find you know, u and v, so we want to find, uh, so u minus v, so that this is zero. No? So one way, the easiest way how, so certainly <coughs> the easiest uh, way how this can happen is if this one minus this one plus q is zero and also this is zero. So, so a sufficient condition for f of u minus v equal to 0 is, you know, these two, and 3 uv minus p is equal to 0. I mean, obviously, we do not know whether we can find a solution for these two equations. We have made our, our problem more difficult. But if we do find a solution for these two equations, we have a solution for our original problem. And, uh, but now, these two each of these equations is much simpler than the original one, obviously. So first, the, the second one we can obviously solve. So, um, where is it? So, so the second equation gives... What is it that v is equal to uh, p divided by the 3u? And we put this into the first. And uh, well, so if I'm not mistaken, you get 3 to the 3. I mean, some, there's some cancellation occurs, which, uh, well, not so much. So 3 to the 3, u to the 6 minus p to the 3, you know, minus p to the 3, plus 3 to the 3, u to the 3, q, is equal to 0. So I claim that this is what you get. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we, 
kind of multiply obviously with the correct power. So by itself, you know, V is something right by U, but we multiply out with the corresponding power of U so that it gets a polynomial. And now what you see here is that some miracle has occurred because this is a quadratic polynomial in U to the third. So we can use our wonderful old uh, thing from school. So we put y equal to u to the third, and then we find the equation. Then the equation becomes well, if I'm not mistaken, y squared plus q y minus p divided by three to the three is equal to zero. And now everybody knows how to, uh, so we have to divide by the correct powers of Q and so on to get this. And so now we can use the quadratic formula that we have just, uh, uh, that's written here. And we find that uh, y is equal to, uh, now p and q have changed their role. This is now, uh, so minus q halves, because q is what before was p, um, plus or minus, but we take maybe just the plus part, uh, q halves squared minus no plus p divided by third to the third. So this is a solution for the y. Now we just have to remember that y was equal to u to the third. So u is the third root of that. Of this. And um, we uh, put, we had put v equal to p divided by three u. So v One did I want? No, no. Did I want this? I don't think I. Yeah, this, however, I didn't want that. So yeah, I want to take the other one. I take the other equation. So I have uh, u to the third plus uh, minus v to the third is e uh, plus q is equal to zero. So we find that uh, v is equal to the third root of y plus q. And if we put now, we can, we know that uh, our x that we want to find the solution of is u minus v. And we can just put everything together. And we find that this will be equal to the third root of minus q halves. Uh, so this is what's written here. So the square root of q halves squared plus p thirds to the third um, minus uh, the thing uh, which you obtain by this. So we have to add q, and there's a minus q half comes, becomes plus q halves. So third root of q halves plus square root of q halves squared plus p divided by third, okay? 
So this is the solution, and we have uh, so <clears throat> we have here made this ansatz, which was not directly justified, but as it leads to a solution, it's fine. <clears throat> and so this is Cardano's formula. So <clears throat> this is not really, uh, uh, you know, Galvathy or algebra, it's just a, a trick, but still, uh, this is this old solution. And there's a, <clears throat> so that's as much as I wanted to say about this. There's a similar, more complicated formula which also works for polynomials of degree four, which I certainly am not going to write down. And so people were trying to do it for higher degree, for degree five and higher. And um, somehow uh, they didn't succeed. I think maybe there were some people who thought they succeeded, but then it was not true. And so, um, you know, this, uh, so people try to, try to understand or try to, you know, wanted to figure out whether at all it was possible. And so this became then the problem. So, so it's a general question of solvability by radicals. So, so there's a similar formula for degree four. Uh, but uh, nobody found one. So one, so quite a lot of group theory, and then Galois three was somehow uh, developed in order to understand this problem, to see whether uh, there will be a formula, or for which polynomials you can find a formula in terms of radicals for the roots. Um, <clears throat> so it was first. Um, first proven by, uh, by Abel uh, that there is no general formula which does it for all polynomials. And now instead, so I, I will not deal with that now. So Abel proved, so I think uh, maybe he was 18 or something, uh, that uh, there is no formula. No such formula <clears throat> for degree five or bigger, I think. Um, but now the question, uh, <clears throat> but so then the question kind of that posed itself is for which polynomials is there a formula? You know, how do you decide whether you can express the roots of a polynomial in terms of uh, of uh, radicals and taking in terms of square roots and tires. And this, this is what uh, Galois did and uh, famously wrote down in the night before the duel. If you know, there's this kind of. <clears throat> so now let's try to formulate the question. So, so the question is, uh, under what conditions? So when can one find, uh, can one express the roots of a polynomial f in kx, say, um, in terms? So maybe normally the old question was obviously was coffee polynomial with coefficients in Q in terms of radicals. Uh, so to, now we want to write this in a more formal way. So let me kind of make this question a bit more precise so that we actually have a way to talk about it properly. So, so we don't restrict our attention to Q. We take K, say, a field of 
characteristic zero. So, so let so for the for the rest of this section. Let K be a field of characteristic zero. And uh, we want to uh, make precise what we mean by the fact that the polynomial that we can express the roots of polynomial in terms of radicals. So definition, the field extension uh, say I can take large k over small k is called a radical extension well if uh, it's obtained by just adjoining Roots of elements in K, to, so uh, of of so more and more roots to it. So extension, if there is a chain, uh, K. So the large field is somehow the last one in the chain. It contains an other field L m minus one, and so on. And in the end, we. The zeroth one is k, such that each step is obtained by adding uh, some k, th some lth root of an element in the previous field. So, such that l i plus one can be written as the field extension of l, l generated by one element, say b i, and. Uh, so for all i, um, with b i is zero of uh, the polynomial x to the n i minus a i for some element a i in l i. So the the next field is always obtained by the, from the previous one by adding some n i root of an element of the smaller field. So we have the, this field extension obtained by only you know step by step adding you know radicals. So <clears throat> um, and then so so thus b i is an n i root of a i as you can see and uh, so we call a polynomial f with coefficients in the small field is called solvable by radicals Uh, well, if there is a radical extension over which it splits. Say k over k, small k, such that f splits over the larger field. Yeah, but actually, this is not quite what I do. The radical extension, which is also Galois, such that um, F splits over K into linear factors. Now, obviously, this condition, so, I mean, if one forgets about the story that, the Galva, that this should be Galois extension, this is the, obviously the reasonable uh, formulation. No, we want to find the field extension, which is just obtained by, you know, adding really nth roots of elements step by step, such that F splits. Now, for technical reasons, we also assume 
we also want to impose that this is the Galois extension. But uh, in fact, it is true that if there exists such an extension for which this thing is Galois, for which k over k is Galois, they also, if, if there exists such an extension over which it splits, then there also exists the Galois extension over which is a Galois radical extension over which it splits, but we don't have time to prove it. It is actually an exercise in the notes, but I don't think a particularly easy one. So exercise. Um, so, what is it? Uh, a condition uh, that uh, k over k is Galois can be removed if there exists a radical extension over which it splits then there is another radical extension which is also Galois over which it splits namely um, uh, if there is a radical extension such that uh, f splits over k. Then we can make k a little bit larger, so it becomes Galois, uh, but it's, it's still radical. Then there exists a radical uh, Galois extension. Uh, say f over k such that uh, uh, f contains k as a subset. And that obviously does it because uh, clearly our polynomial f as it splits over k, it splits over the field f. But uh, we don't have the, it's not so difficult, but don't have the time, or I think I'd, we don't have the time to prove that now. So we will put this additional assumption. And um, <clears throat> so what we want to prove is um, that the solvability of polynomials by radicals has something to do with the property of uh, groups, namely the solvability of the group. So that the the theorem, which uh, is due to uh, essentially to Galois, is that um, the, the polynomial can be solved by radicals if and only if the Galois group is solvable. But first, I have to tell you what it is. So, whether F is solvable by radicals. Has to do with the property of the Galois group. So the Galois group of F, which by definition is the Galois group of the splitting field of F. Uh, namely, again, this is called solvability. And so we want to introduce this now. And as usual, we uh, group theory in its beginning was mostly motivated from studying field extensions, mostly by studying polynomials. So the notion of solvable for a group comes from the notion of solvable by radical for a polynomial. Okay. Maybe now solvable groups are more important than the question of whether polynomials are solvable by radicals, but it comes from there. So let me define what this is. So a group G is called solvable is some kind of generalization of abelian so that you can kind of 
make successive quotients so that the, so we have kind of a chain of subgroups so that all the quotients are, uh, so of normal subgroups that all the intermediate quotients are abelian. So if there's a chain of subgroups, so we have that G is, so to speak, the zeroth one. It contains a subgroup G1 contains G2, and so on, Gn, such that the G of, so these Gi are all subgroups. The last one is the trivial subgroup, such that the following hold. Uh, so the Gi are themselves just subgroups, but we have that Gi plus 1 is a normal subgroup in Gi. for all i, g i plus 1 is a normal subgroup in g i. And so if it is a normal subgroup, we can talk about the quotient group, and the quotient group is a billion. So the group uh, G itself doesn't have to be a billion, but you can somehow kind of filter it so that all the intermediate pieces are a billion. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, for instance, we have that... Uh, uh, so as an example, obviously abelian groups are solvable. That's not so exciting, but um, maybe the simplest non-commutative group which is solvable would be, uh, so S3 is solvable. Um, you can see this in several more or less equivalent ways. So we have, uh, in this particular case, we have a, the group of uh, two cycles, so which is generated by the cycle one, two, three, uh, is a, a normal subgroup. I think you had seen that or something, but anyway, it's very easy. So just you have one, two, three, one, two, three squared, one, two, three to the third. This is a normal subgroup. And um, you can easily see the quotient S3 divided by this normal subgroup. And this normal subgroup has three elements, so this must be a group with two elements. There's only one such group, so this is isomorphic to Z2. You can also see the same thing in a different way. We had introduced the sign of a permutation. So this, the sign uh, is a map from, in this case, from S3 to the set, to the group 1 minus 1, you know, with multiplication, which is the same as Z2 as a group. And the kernel is precisely the even permutations. And the even permutations are precisely, is precisely this normal subgroup. So this again shows that this is a normal subgroup, and the kernel is isomorphic to Z2. So we see that this is a solvable group. Um, OK. Now, we need some. In general, we want some kind of way to decide whether a group is solvable or not. So we want to have some kind of way to decide whether a group is solvable. And this is basically by finding a canonical way of getting this chain. So there's some kind of procedure of produce, producing this chain. And so if this, chain, if this procedure works, it's solvable. If the procedure does not work, it's not solvable. So, and this has to do with the commutator subgroup. So definition. And then I think I have to go before <laughs> you get into trouble. So we, get, we take G a group. Um, and if you have two elements, A, B, and G, we can form the commutator. Uh, 
you know, this is A. B, it's just another way to write A, B minus B, A. No? So this is the commutator of these elements. Clearly, the commutator will be uh, zero if and only if A and B commute. No? Let's see that. So A, B is equal to zero if and only if. Well, A, B equal to B, A. That's not very deep. <coughs> ah, except that it's not zero. We take our group and multiply it, have it multiplicatively. So it's one, okay? We have, you know, the, and this is not minus. So I, I mixed here the, you know, you should. Uh, so I denote my group multiplicatively because I don't assume it's commutative. So it's A, B times, and I may, maybe have also decided whether I want it in this order. I decided the other way around, A to the minus one, B to the minus one, A, B. So I just have denoted the group with multiplication, not with addition. Obviously cannot mix it. And then uh, that the commutator is one is equivalent to this. Um, and then the commutator subgroup of G is the subgroup generated by our commutators. So the commutator subgroup is usually called G prime, sometimes called derived group. G of G is the subgroup generated by all commutators A, B, I, with um, A and B elements in G. And um, clearly, uh, the group is abelian if and only if the commutator group is equal to uh, just one. So G is abelian if and only if G prime is equal to one. Because if, uh, you know, <coughs> Because that precisely says that all the commutators are one. Okay, so I think my time is up. There was already some, <laughs> some nervous person trying to come in. So uh, we meet uh, uh, you know, on, on Tuesday. On Tuesday? Well, okay, anyway, we meet next week. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah.